Okay, I think I'm going out live and I am sh scheduled to start this at nine o'clock, which is about a minute away, I think. So just get everything set up. Um, So I don't know who's viewing today, this evening. Helps if I could see. So I'm just about to start. Uh, nine o'clock. I think it's nine o'clock. I think I'm live. <laughs> it's impossible to tell, but at any rate, um, Hi, my name's Jeremy Bruin and welcome to this second live stream on designing in wood. It's a mini lecture, so what I intend doing is talking about three of my designs for about 15 minutes. And I was asked in the last live stream if I would uh, talk you through how I design a piece of my furniture. So. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes and hopefully uh, raise the important issues because it's quite a, a complex subject and I, I actually think I'm probably one of the very few people on YouTube and certainly in the woodworking field who's tackling designing. So I want to start with some definitions and then when I've spoken for 15 minutes I'll then hopefully answer any questions you have. So the intention, as with the previous one, is that it's about half an hour long. But, you know, if the questions are engaging and there are enough people watching, then I'll stay longer. So if you just tuned in, welcome. Uh, the topic is designing in wood. And in particular, um, I've chosen a few pieces of my own. And... Uh, the one you can see here is a drinks cabinet that I was invited to design and submit for an auction, the very first auction at Sotheby's in England, in London, the very first auction of living uh, designers work. So it was uh, on British contemporary crafts and it actually sold. So, and I was a completely unknown um, young furniture maker at the time and um, so that was quite exciting because it actually sold to the art collection of the richest man in the world who at that time was Paul Getty. Uh, but I don't normally sell to the rich so I need to clarify that straight away that um, I made a living for several decades making furniture all to my own design and trying to produce them at a cost that was affordable so that's one of the factors in design is, is design for economics. But first of all, uh, what is design? Well, design, uh, forget the word for a moment, design, and think about it as a problem solving activity. And language is very, very important. And I'm gonna deal with this. The language that you use. So if I were designing a chair, I would re define the language. I'd say I want to design a support for the body at a given height for a particular purpose like for comfortable easy sitting or for for eating at a table and then I would avoid preconceptions. I think I'd, I covered a little bit of that in, um, in um, the first one. I'm going to say a brief hello to a couple of guys. Love the suit. Yep this cost me about 20 pounds at a second-hand shop it's a 1950s jacket and the bow tie I bought the other day online and it took me about half an hour to put it on but welcome um, and um, I better get a move on because I'm going to speak for about five minutes on each of the designs and the first one is this uh, uh, drinks cabinet so I then sent myself a brief and I thought well as with most of my designs, it has to please me first before uh, it will please anybody else. So I designed it for my own living room and 
corners are often a dead space so straight away I made it triangular in section and so that sits into a corner. I then thought well what's the problem because you have to define the brief with designing and work through a solution uh, in fact a series of solutions to get the final solution and I thought so often cabinets are let down by the handles they're the very point of contact very point of human contact and yet they're like an add-on they're incongruous to the design so I thought around the problem and I came up with the idea of well how about a cabinet that doesn't use handles so this centre flap you can see uh, the one on the left which is actually the prototype um, if you press the right part then it pivots down there's a little wooden spring that stops the flap from uh, banging down and then you can open the doors so it's a drinks cabinet and it houses about 12 bottles and a similar number of glasses so it's quite functional and the other thing about this particular piece is that I made it from one solid piece of ash so I cut the ash two inch thick board of ash into veneers and you can see or I can hope you can see uh, that the veneers are book matched and the veneers were about quarter of an inch thick uh, that's how they came off my bandsaw and then I put them through a drum sander and reduced them to about an eighth of an inch thickness and a little subtle detail that you probably need to see the cabinet is um, that it that the, the, those black marks are gaps in between the doors and the pivots and it's radius so you can actually see the end grain of the thick veneers so in other words I made a veneer look <coughs> excuse me made a veneer look solid <coughs> so that's the first design my drinks cabinet and I'm going to move on now to this one which I think is a good example for designing I think I designed this in 1985 and it was for an exhibition in Bristol at Bristol Museum to celebrate 500 years um, since uh, John Cabot who was an explorer who sailed from Bristol to Newfoundland, North America. So my brief here was um, I decided to make a table and it had to reflect uh, the theme of Cabot well Cabo had this crazy idea that the earth is round so immediately I thought of a round table and he sailed to North America so I thought well let's use uh, a, a Canadian rock maple so immediately I'm kind of attempting to solve the brief that I set myself which is to echo the theme of Cabo now this first sketch here you can see uh, is a long way from the finished solution and if I and this is the one that evolved so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play a short video it's about a minute and a half long of um, making it and I'll try and talk you through it so here I am in my workshop in 1985 uh, halfway through making the table I've got pretty basic equipment decided to make it out of solid maple as I said here I am band sawing the shape uh, very very simple and and here are some of the sketches of how I started so I started at the wrong point I should have started with the sketches uh, so I just kind of doodled and sketched and I eventually landed up playing with the name Cabo and I thought well let's try and create some fish like uh, shapes and so this was the first idea and then I kind of came up with this and I thought yeah that's the table so I hope that makes it clear to you the thinking process I use very basic machines this is a small uh, 10 inch planar thicknesser that I still have to this day all my machines are very very small um, and then here I am uh, sanding the curves of these fish like shapes that make up the legs of the table 
so it's all quite straightforward really um, while I'm talking please do um, post up some questions because in five minutes time I'm hoping to answer your questions so feel free to say hello a couple of people have said hello so far and um, and yes uh, I, I will um, Antonio's just said very out of the ordinary and um, well for me personally that's a very good point for me personally there's absolutely no point in me making what everybody else is which is what tends to happen people do variations of what exists and they just make it cheaper or more expensive but I could never compete with others so right from the start I've always done things I've done things my way and I'm really inspired by the material by the timber by the techniques by the limited tools I've got um, and and the great secret I believe is to keep it simple uh, so um, hello good evening Joe you have missed the first 10 minutes but I hope you'll tune in later what I've done is I've covered my drinks cabinet explained the uh, thinking behind that I'm now on my second piece which is the Cabo table Cabo was an explorer and uh, thought that the world was round so I designed this for an exhibition in 1985 at Bristol Museum and Art Gallery and um, and my table depicted his name you can see the name Cabo there if I just get rid of the video a moment you'll maybe see it a little bit easier and there you are there's a, a sketch of the table and his name so one of the important things about how I particularly design is that I sketch a lot and then I get down to the workshop I don't use computers uh, I mean, I was uh, making furniture before <coughs> the advent of, of um, <coughs> excuse me, CAD. I don't even know what the word means, computer-aided design. It's far too complicated for me. I'm trying to learn CNC woodworking at the moment, and it's taken me so long. Was you know, I, I trained, part of my training was as an illustrator, and it's very very quick for me to get ideas straight out of my head onto the paper and it's a cyclic thing because you you then that prompts you to um, evolve a design never start at the solution always work through a series of problems as I say I use North American uh, Canadian rock maple because Cabo sailed to uh, North America Okay, so the Cabo table, yes, it was a one-off. What I'm going to do is I'm going to answer your questions, if I may. Um, after I've delivered all the pieces, although I can see the logic of answering now, I just didn't want to get too distracted, but uh, I will answer that. How easy was it to find the maple in the UK? Very easy, uh, Bobtail. Uh, and touch wood we can still get it you know I'm amazed that we can still get hold of timber the, the way that this planet wastes materials and valuable materials not to mention the Brazilian uh, rainforest which is the lungs of the world uh, the drinks cabinet uh, Evren I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly I made four of those. The first one sold to the art collection of the richest man in the world, Paul Getty. And as I said earlier, I don't normally sell for the rich because I don't socialize with the very wealthy. I mostly make um, furniture for ordinary people. Uh, but it's a struggle because there's a very cheap market and a very expensive market. And there doesn't seem to be much in the middle. And that's where I'm aimed at. So, moving on, I'm going to now deal with the third piece, which is a jukebox. <clears throat> and I had a stroke, of, a stroke of luck in 2005. I won the Professional Woodworker of the Year Award, uh, promoted by the Woodworker magazine and sponsored by Ryobi Power Tools. And I won £2,000 worth of power tools. It was all my Christmases that came in together. And the piece I submitted was this um, touchscreen uh, jukebox. Uh, and the idea came to me because uh, I noticed that in banks they use touchscreens. So this was um, 
2005 and about four years before the Apple iPad was invented. And of course you can get all this on an iPad, but it's basically a jukebox. It's wedge shaped because uh, you can, um, you've got the computer and the amplifier and the bass woofer at the bottom, uh, going up to the loudspeakers and room for headphones in the top. And in fact, I'll just set the video going. Uh, I hope my voice isn't coming out echoey as it was in the previous one. I don't know why it is, but hopefully it just comes and goes. So <clears throat> while I'm talking, you, you can see the video and uh, my workshop is very small. I've replaced that bandsaw. I've got a really big one now, uh, plus some very small bandsaws. Uh, so yeah, the hardware I used was uh, just a computer. And I actually designed the software using PowerPoint to make a very basic interface for a jukebox, but it crashed, it could only take about 20 songs. So I then downloaded this software called Touch Tone, and within three clicks you can access any song in the known universe. Isn't that incredible? I mean, we're so spoiled by technology. So. This is showing how I made it. I made it out of maple again, um, one of my favorite woods. I even used a grinder in a power drill just to get into the inside so that the timbre would uh, go round tightly. Here you are, there's the timbre. And that's uh, using MDF with, um, no, using birch plywood with a very, very fine groove cut almost all the way through so that's what gives it a flex and there you are there's the touch screen so um, and then behind the back my friend is accessing the headphones so I could actually walk down the road about 100 meters away and listen to my jukebox how uh, crazy is that but uh, yeah uh, very very simple design uh, I kind of tapered the planks plank effect using maple, used, made very thin planks. Another thing is to avoid it warping and bowing, I used aluminium angle iron on the inside uh, with slot screws to uh, firm it all up. And uh, the only change I've made to it is I upgraded the computer and uh, to take Blu-ray and then I've got a huge uh, 48 inch flat screen monitor which is an extension and they tend to use it as a video kiosk. So I think that is <coughs> the three pieces and which were the cabo table and the drinks cabinet and on the topic of design before I take your questions and while I remember I'd just like to show you uh, the ebook that I've started making, uh, started creating, which is called Design and Make in Wood, and it's going to be really in depth. It's going to be a unique publication. It's based on a successful course that I ran for many years in my studio, an intensive course that was 36 hours. That was 12 evening sessions of three hours each. I took on total beginners. I took on took on women who'd never done woodwork before and they learned designing and making right at the same time. So designing is, it involves decision making, it involves asking questions, it, it involves defining the language, emptying your mind of preconceptions. So that is that and I'm sorry I keep on looking away from the camera because I've got everything going on another screen. So thank you for joining in and uh, Antonio says there's a very different perspective of carpentry between America and Europe. Well please tell me what you think the difference is. Um, I wouldn't say my work is typical and it's not actually carpentry, it, it's furniture design what I'm showing you here. Uh, uh, your photography is very professional, are they your own or was it taken? No, I do everything myself. 
which is probably crazy, but I I do all my illustration, all my own photography, because it costs a lot of money hiring a photographer, and I always feel that, especially with chairs, they'll, they'll never get the right angle. I know the best angle, the best aspect, the most attractive aspect for, uh, for a picture. Learning to draw, so important. Uh, very primitive. Hello, Antonio again. Um, very primitive, the CNC from the 1985 era. I don't understand that. Maybe you could... Um, how did I go about... Everyone asked me how I went about making the cabinet, but I explained that. So I guess you didn't come to the lecture at the beginning. I have one request, one request. If I do a series of lectures, please try and attend punctually. And then, because I'm trying to condense them, I'm not trying to waffle on. I'm trying to avoid what a lot of people do in these uh, woodworking live streams. They, they show off their kids or their wives, all the rest of it. I'm just sticking to woodworking. And um, a friend said to me, well, you, you know, people come to your channel expecting woodworking. Well, actually, my channel is very carefully uh, split into different categories. So there's categories on guitar playing, guitar making, on music, on high-tech gadgets, and then on woodworking. So you can pick and choose what you want. But if I deal with woodworking, then I just focus on woodworking. So I, I do hope you will view some of my other videos. Uh, so, Antonio, it's more artistic than commercial. Well, there's no reason why it shouldn't be commercial. Uh, the, the problem with commerce is mass production will always compromise. They'll go for the lowest common denominator. But I think things will change. And you've only got to look at the car market, that you've got the Ford or the, I don't know, the General Motors or whatever, or if you're in Australia, the Holden at one end, and then you've got the Rolls-Royce and the Ferrari and the Porsche at the other end. So within woodworking and furniture making, there should be a much, much wider uh, spectrum. But it, uh, but commercial, well, it's all changing. Um, but my work is commercial because that's what I've survived from, making my own designs. That's what paid my rent and my mortgage. And uh, I'm not saying I made a fortune from it. I didn't. But, uh, and also some of my designs are batch produced, so I repeat them. Uh, I mean, I think more of study or to translate more on paper. So I'm not understanding that. Um, he's probably talking about a router. Please ask me any question you like about um, designing. Uh, and helping you get started because this seems to be a problem and one of the things I would say is try and empty your mind of preconceptions it's easier for a total beginner and often women who don't inherit the culture of woodworking that is traditionally male orientated it's easier for them to design because they don't have the preconceptions and you have to be um, quite objective you've also got to be able to think outside the box and just ask a lot of questions like what if I use this joint or what if I use that material or what if I use a very thin material uh, in fact in my ebook uh, one of the uh, things is a unique strategy that I'm not going to give away here but it's in my ebook and it's a strategy that helps you get started designing <clears throat> so um, that should be completed soon and are there any more questions please good evening Joe um, oh I've already said good evening uh, please does proper carpentry have more cachet than non-traditional woodworking. <sighs> it's 
So I don't understand that. What what is proper carpentry? I the, the, the thing is, there's a lot of um, around the world. There are different meanings attached to different aspects of woodworking. In in Britain, carpentry is um, on a building site, houses like door frames and window sills. Then we have joinery, which is involves jointing, and then we have fine cabinet making, which is what I trained in and that relates to furniture more but i don't know what's proper i mean i don't do anything proper all i the stuff i do is totally unusual um but it's very simple in concept that's what i'm aiming for uh bold simple designs sorry i'm looking away it's really difficult to keep control of all this technology so <clears throat> what else economics you see when you're designing when I design I design for economics of material economics of time uh, because you know time is money and it all adds up uh, I work within the constraints of the tools I've got I mean I've now got just about every tool under the sun but when I started I just had a bunch of hand tools and I had no money to buy machines so uh, <laughs> Joe says I think people are thinking in one language and writing in another it must be very difficult if English isn't your your first uh, nat natural tongue so I beg your pardon uh, it's arrogant of me to expect everybody to speak English. Um, I'm Scottish myself. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Maybe because the Scottish are an inventive race. I think I have inherited a talent for designing. So, but I would like to make it easy for you. Uh, it's not an easy thing to teach, but it can be learned. So, so Bob Tail talks about the end. I still don't understand this. You say, I mean fine cabinet making as opposed to designing with the end result in mind, whatever it takes. I, I'm can't make sense of that I'm sorry um, because fine cabinet making tends to imply a rigid set of traditional rules I I I have applied those traditional rules to totally modern work so sometimes I challenge and I rebel and I reject tradition other times I use tradition but when you talk about the end result in mind I, the end result is an aim at a solution. It's not, the end result isn't, you know, if I'm designing a chair, I'm not starting with four legs. I might arrive at four legs, but the process of asking questions and saying, what if I do this? What if it looks like that? What if that, what, blah, blah, blah. That evolves to maybe a solution that has four legs or maybe it doesn't have legs at all. Maybe my next chair is going to float on a cushion of hot air, why not? Years and years ago, I thought of a coloured cushion of air that would act as a door so that when you walk through it with a tray full of, um, you know, from a meal, a tray full of crockery, you, you wouldn't have to nudge the door open because you haven't got a spare hand. And of course, this is in, I mean, I was about 10 years old when I dreamt that, but of course, that's in all the science fiction films uh, and is probably a reality now. So... That was slightly off the point, but it wasn't really. It's all about designing and thinking outside the box. Uh, I Have I answered all the questions so far? I mean, this live streaming, to be honest, is quite difficult. And I guess one of the benefits, because I do try and prepare this is that people will be watching this later on I think my previous one there were about 12 people watching but there are now 400 over 400 views and so what I do 
is I, um, when it's up there recorded a day later on my channel, I then add a menu and a time frame. So, you know, for instance, at five minutes, 30 seconds, we're talking about such and such a thing so that you can um, you can fast forward to that. So YouTube is a very flexible thing, but uh, what else? Have I missed some? Please ask me questions. I'm coming up to half an hour and I would like to answer questions. Good evening, Joe. Uh, Joe, you um, you linked in the other day and of course you've missed the lecture. I've been speaking for half an hour. Uh, oh, I'm assuming that you've only just joined. And one of the questions I've got is please you guys tell me when is a good time I've only I did one on a Saturday night at nine o'clock and then I thought Sunday would be better but I've no idea but obviously I would like to pitch these at an optimum time of viewing but in this lecture I've been talking through the my design process my thinking uh, for three designs, the uh, drinks cabinet, the cabo table and the jukebox. So, <clears throat> well just while you're thinking about what to ask me, a friend of mine gave me this yesterday to repair. Now, if I I don't know whether you can see, but that is coopered. It's a beautiful little uh, um, circular container. I forget what it's used for, but she, for some reason, she left it outdoors, and, uh, and of course it shrunk. So she's asked me to repair it. So I will probably put a band around it and re-glue it, and then I'll just clean it up a bit and put a bit of oil or something. But you know that's the wonder of woodworking that occasionally people you ask ask you to do things that you don't normally do and I don't like to say no so when I've got a bit of spare time which is a laugh I never have any spare time um, oh hello uh, Antonio you told me it's 3 30 in the afternoon it's great to let me know um, you just joined uh, Joe bloody kids you said yeah I was talking about kids earlier on and I'm saying that I'm I'm not one of these woodworking live streamers who shows off his kids in the workshop um, you know that if I say I'm going to deliver it on woodworking that's what I'm going to deliver on I mean only joking that's a shrink pot ha ha yes it is um, but uh, yes what else? I've run out of things to say. Good evening if you've just joined. I dressed up especially for the occasion for you guys. Are there any girls out there? Do you know about 9% of my viewers are women and yet when I was teaching in colleges in education for two or three decades it was my mission to encourage women to take up woodwork and there was so much prejudice against them and now hardly any women watch my channel I'm really pissed off about that so please share and get get the girls to come and watch my woodwork and the thing is YouTube is changing so much at the moment it's um... but Joe you must tell me it may be nine o'clock on a Sunday isn't a good time please tell me what's an ideal time for you because feedback is what shapes my channel whether it's the videos the edited videos I make or this live streaming it's got to be based on what you guys get the most out of what I'm able to offer. I just cannot copy other people. I'm not interested in doing what other live streamers do. I've got a particular angle on wood, on design. It's not going to appeal to everybody, but am I still working, Jeremy? What, what do you mean working? I work about 14 hours a day, Antonio. Um, and I'm juggling with so many things, it's crazy. 
uh, and method is so important. I might do a live streaming on method. So please give me ideas of what you'd like me to um, live stream on to, de to deliver a mini lecture. And while I think about it, um, I'm involved with a really exciting award. For the last seven years, I've been a judge for the Alan Peters Award for Excellence. Alan Peters was probably the greatest furniture designer maker of the late 20th century. I had the good fortune to know him. He helped me enormously as a young man to get my work <coughs> recognized. Um, and he sadly died in 2009. And um, the award was going for seven years. Suddenly the host of the award suddenly dropped it and I thought, no, this award's too important. So I am negotiating with a major British mag magazine and a major tool supplier. I'm not going to say who at the moment, but it's looking very optimistic that the award will continue on with good sponsorship. And I want to make it, I've got my judges lined up, two other judges, and it will be the Alan Peters Furniture Award. And we want to aim it from 18 to 35 year olds you don't have to have been to college. Obviously it would be of interest to those at college, but we want it to be totally inclusive. So that's just by the by, and I'll be posting something on my channel. So design, how do I design things? That was the topic this evening. I don't mind running on a little bit if uh, you have questions to ask me. Uh, have I an opinion on modern schooling? Well, I think the colleges, I'll be very honest here, I think, I think in my design and make course, which was 36 hours, I achieved more than many colleges achieve in a year. Uh, there's a lot of inefficiency because they don't put a time value on education. And also a lot of the people who are in teaching are, are, are really out of touch with making. Um, uh, that's a very harsh criticism, but uh, they're, all, they're also very, very expensive, most of the schools, and I'm not, I don't feel very comfortable about that because it's already an expensive thing to get into in terms of getting a workshop, getting all your equipment. So, uh, could we put a name to your style? You're more than welcome. Um, I don't mind if you say it's very 70s-ish. Uh, when you design a piece, do you always stick to the plan? Does it change during the pro? Well, of course it changes, Joe. Yes, I. what I suggest you do if you've got time is watch this video um, again, you know, when you've got time and it's up. Watch it from the beginning because I went through. It doesn't matter. Don't apologize for not answering it because you couldn't help tuning in late. I was listening on the radio actually today about this controversy that parents think they have a right to take their kids out of school and go on holidays or attend weddings, blah, blah, blah. And nobody's ever thought from the teacher's point of view. I used to teach woodwork in schools and got very high results because I had a very tightly structured syllabus or program. And if a kid was away, and they missed a couple of lessons, it meant that they, they, they were out of the loop. And I had to deal with 25 other kids who were up to speed and then deal with the kid that was away. Now, obviously, kids can't help being sick. And if there's a funeral, of course, there has been an exception. But I couldn't believe how selfish the parents were that you need a structure. But the great thing about this is because it's recorded, you can watch it uh, later on. I'm surprised to hear, well, um, I hope the Alan Peters Award is in safe hands, Joe, but it was a shock. And, um, and I immediately jumped on the case. And you know what? Where there's a will, there's a way. I won't get into politics this way at the moment, but if there's a will, there's always a way. And I think my will kept me going against the odds. When I started designing furniture, I had hardly any tools. There was no market. I had a converted cattle shed. I'll get the violin out in a moment, but I, it wasn't exactly on my side. 
and I was also totally unknown and it's very much a name game and I landed up exhibiting with the top names who were selling their work for hundreds of thousands of pounds but I, even if I wanted to I wouldn't sell furniture for that it would go to the wrong people I want the people who buy my furniture appreciate it I tried buying back one of my rocking chairs I've made 300 of them all over the world and people have flatly refused to sell them back to me because they're going to hand them down to their kids. Now, now what could be more satisfying than that? That, um, that they and, and I've always had this thing that a piece of furniture should last at least as long as it took the tree to grow. So if that ash tree, say, matured at 150 years, that's not a bad thing in your mind. Of course, none of us have got any control um, whether stuff how it will survive, but that is the intention. I mean, you, you know, it will perish in the fire or whatever. So, any more questions, please? Um, funnily enough, I've got more people watching now than, than when my lecture officially ended at, at 9.30, 9.30 GMT time. But I don't mind, I'll hang around. What I don't want to do is land up waffling. Um, so if you've got questions, um, do I spend much of my time in my bird hide? Oh, well, thanks for watching the uh, videos presumably you have on the bird, hi bird hide. To be honest, I haven't because I find it a little bit isolating down there. I'd love to share it uh, with others, whether it's for wildlife or camping. Um, Antonio saying goodbye. Um, Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you for your time, Antonio. Please tune in again and to my channel and subscribe and like and all the rest of it. Isn't it crazy that all these YouTube videos and everybody says right before they've said anything, oh, please like me, please subscribe to me. Um, I'm waking up to the modern harsh reality of YouTube in 2019. So, um, design is such an exciting thing. I mean, I've always, I've been passionate about design for, uh, you know, ever since I trained in traditional cabinet making in the 1960s. And I started designing in schools. I might have mentioned before that I taught in some really rough schools and the only way to stop discipline problems was to design things that the kids really wanted to make and it would really absorb them. So um, have I completed the construction of my CNC router, Sergeant Maker? No I haven't but I've just uploaded this evening my third episode of my adventures into CNC woodworking. I got the little Chinese uh, CNC machine working. I couldn't get the spindle working. Days and days, it turned out I hadn't got the thing plugged in. Ugh. But the bigger one, I'm, it's just taking so long. But it, it'll be satisfying. Uh, do I feel there are still younger people wishing to get into making? And the, Well, that's a good question, Joe. Do I feel there's still younger people wishing to get into making? Well. For a start, I don't really know, but I suspect a lot more of them would get into it if the opportunity was there. And that's why the Alan Peters Award is so important. I want to start reaching right down to schools because I feel our schools are letting our young people down by depriving them of personal development through their hands. I'm not saying the country needs a nation of carpenters. I'm saying that by using your hands, these fantastic things, hands, hand and mind, that um, you learn so many life skills through it. It's scandalous that it's uh, being chased out of the school curriculum. So I think more young people would. I'm confident they would. But of course, the majority, a lot of young people are busy fiddling with their thumbs, uh, totally absorbed in mobile phones but everything changes you know do, everything changes nothing remains the same and also we can never predict what's going to happen 
Uh, do I teach classes? Do I get asked to teach classes? Well, I used to be headhunted. I mean, I've had jobs where they've asked me to do the job and then interviewed me later. I could write a book on the opportunities, but you get to a certain age and your hair turns white and you get forgotten. You know, there's new regimes, they're much younger people, they don't know who you are, they don't know your history. So um, I have, um, from being headhunted, I now have to get off my backside and start knocking on doors and saying, would you like me to give you a lecture? And even then, it's not easy. So, I, I mean, I'm teaching with my friend Andrew Lawton. We're giving a lecture at the Gordon Russell Museum in June, I think it's June the 22nd. And the topic I think is very interesting, it's called product or service. And Andrew is going to argue the case that he as a designer maker provides a service and people, the client asks him to make what they want and he does it in his style and I have always been product led. I have created a design, put it out to the market and if you like it you buy it, if you don't like it you don't. But the client doesn't tell me what to do. Um, I usually show them the door because the client is not the artist, I am. I know that sounds, it may sound arrogant but I am an artist and you wouldn't ask Van Gogh to paint uh, in somebody else's style. And so my market is very small, but my clients understand. Um, they come to me because they've seen my style and they'll, and they'll give me freedom to interpret whatever. I probably didn't answer the question. What's the best wood to practice cutting dovetails? Um, Wayne, the topic actually is on designing. Um, I, I prefer not to drift off, but I will answer it because I, I, I suspect you've just joined in. Uh, but uh, I would use Geluton if you want to practice. I, if you're in Britain, use Geluton. It's very, very soft. I think Rob Cosman in Canada, I watched him cut dovetails and he cut them like butter. And I think he said it was Northeastern pine or something, a Canadian pine. Uh, Sergeant Maker, you're in the United States. Of course, I'm in England. Um, well, these old-fashioned skills, even though we've got robot technology and automation that is going to replace a lot of jobs, it still does not replace the incredible power and skill of hand and mind. There are times when it's quicker uh, to use your hands and, um, you know, I often think of when the Japanese cars hit the European market, the, the engines were really compact. And, and a mechanic would feed his hand down the bonnet and he'd feel for the nut and bolt, whatever. I mean, to design a computer that can get into such a confined space and do what it can't see, it, it would cost thousands, thousands of pounds. So I think these technologies and these skills should go hand in hand. Speaking of white hair and aging, how much has it negatively impacted your making? It hasn't impacted my na making because I was always against the grain. When I was a young man, I was making stuff differently to what everybody else was doing. But I would say in life generally, um, ageism in Britain is appalling because in other cultures, you would be considered as a wise person, a wise elder. I don't like the word elder because I feel as though I'm 35 years old. I'm very young. I ride high-powered motorbike. I play badminton. I'm fast around the court, but I can't deny my biological age and the perception that I'm an old guy. Uh, people have called me an oldie and grandpa on my YouTube channel, so I just have to laugh that off. But um, I personally don't white, like white hair. People say you look distinguished. I'm not ready to look distinguished. I'm too busy out there trying to make the most of my life. And I guess my legacy is my and my furniture designs. My passion is for designing. Seems everything kids get into is technology driven. Yeah, crazy, because technology is very fragile. I mean, I'm exploring 
CNC because I want to understand what it's all about. And the first thing I want to do is engage with the material um, rather than set a program and then go off and have a cup of coffee and have this awful bzzz noise going on and then you've got a finished product. I want to be there and I don't want it to do everything but just to do what other things can't do which is repeat certain things that are, uh, you know, a drudgery to do. So, anything else? Uh, we, we talked about white hair. Joe, you're, you say that um, you believe that everything will go full circle. You're absolutely right. And um, I just hope there is, what I dread is a total breakdown, which of course is portrayed in all the sci-fi post-acalyptic movies and that is quite scary because we're not prepared and, and uh, one of the values of making things is it does teach you survival skills to a degree but uh, the fact that um, what's it called GPS controls air traffic, hospitals, traffic systems, and if that goes down, we are completely knackered. It's scary how much reliance we put on the computer and on uh, Wi-Fi, etc. Uh, but then, well, slowing down. I think the great thing is there are, you know, human nature is very diverse and there are some people who don't use computers, some people who, in woodworking, who just use hand tools. I mean, good for them. Uh, I love, I embrace personally the combination of hand tools, solid wood, veneered wood, manufactured boards, power tools, and now CNC. Everything is like a toolkit, it's part of a toolkit. Be with fake news and, and oh yes. We have to be optimistic, Joe, about the state of the world. Uh, I sometimes wonder whether the state of the world is in constant flux. It was always this way. And there are just different fears in different ages. I mean, 150 years ago, people would die at the age of 25 because of toothache. We take it for granted we've got anaesthetic and that touch wood. In many cases, pain is reduced. Um, but that's slightly off the topic of design. <laughs> so, my kids don't even get books in school, well I can't believe this. I, I sadly left education, I was, I was pretty pissed off at the way education was going, so I left formal education, having trained to a high level in education and being passionate about passing on skills. I do it in my small way, I do it through my ebooks, through my YouTube channel. I just hope young people are watching and learning and not despairing because they are our future. I mean, the whole woodworking scene is geared so much towards the semi retired woodworker, the professional, the person who's got his house, got his garage, got his space, and young people they're renting everything, it, it's crazy. I think we owe it to them. Because there's always people who are good um, creatively, you know, with their hand. It's a wonderful thing being practical. Are there any pieces I've seen that I wish I'd designed? Um, no, but I just admire. Um, I mean, I've got my design heroes. Uh, through history and I think how clever and um, and I think that's so simple why didn't I think of that but I'm, I'm quite happy with I don't think I'll ever run out of ideas if I've got any problem at all it's getting a big enough market for my ideas but I'm hoping CNC will help me produce my ideas more um, efficiently and to reduce the cost and maybe sell up market pack flat furniture that's cut out on CNC, finished by hand, all the wood personally selected and, and, and arriving in a nice little flat pack. 
and that people assemble it. You know, what, what's wrong with upmarket IKEA? People knock IKEA as being cheap. It's very, very intelligent design. And it's not all cheap either. So, um, yes, Joe, you're absolutely right. The, the world did survive the millennium. The problem is human fear is the thing that sells newspapers, it, it sells industries, and uh, there was a fear the world would end then, but it, it didn't happen. What's my favorite piece that I've designed? Um, mm, probably my zigzag table, and of course, have I got, let's try and find a picture of it. Oh, I might have deleted it. Uh, what a nuisance. Here we are, zigzag. Yeah, my zigzag table. I designed this in 1978. It, it was, again, it was uh, an idea that happened. I, I thought, oh, let's, let's get away from four-leg tables. How about three-legged? And I was drawing these parallel strips of wood because I've always liked the way the Scandinavians laminate strips. And the way they, they joined in the middle, and I, I depicted this zigzag so the zigzag I didn't start with it I arrived at the zigzag and then the first one made in 1978 which is the picture on the top right and then i would made about four or five they sold for about two and a half thousand pounds but I am pleased because they're very much a crafted item but it's also innovative because not many people have invented new joints usually new designs involve traditional joints usually so yeah, I'm pleased about that. How on earth did you begin to design that? Ah, well, you must have asked me that just before I, before I explained. <clears throat> but it's no big, it's no big secret because you, you don't start at the solution. You work through a series, maybe I should have used more, shown more sketches. I'm gonna do an ebook, which is like my sketchbook because I never throw sketches away. And you just doodle, you just play and let the pencil take you wherever it takes you. In the back of your mind you're thinking, how can I keep it simple? How am I gonna make it? How can I use the tools that I've got? There's no good designing it and then find you can't make it. Uh, what materials will I use? The first one was elm, so I laminated it to make the elm stable because a, a solid elm will move all over the place. So there was a logic to cutting these strips. And then when I put the three pieces together in a sketch, the way the strips intersected depicted the, uh, the zigzag joint. So actually it was very easy. So what is the most difficult thing you find if you're interested in designing? What is the block? What stops you doing what I'm doing that I find easy? That's what fascinates me. Because I guarantee a lot of the things that you do, like falling off a log, that you find easy, I find very difficult. Um, it does take... A capacity or an outlook to think outside the box. So to think outside the box you've got to be aware of what's going on in the box. <laughs> so if you're designing a table, inside box thinking is it's got to have four legs, it's got to have a flat surface. Well some of my earlier tables had three legs, didn't have legs at all, they had runners, um, I use slats instead of solid pieces. I was doing this back in the 70s, 1970s, probably 20, 20, 30 years before they started appearing in mass-produced furniture. But it's not being afraid to do something different because uh, if it doesn't sell, if it's a real disaster, then cut it up and use it as firewood. It, it's no big deal. It's like playing. Um, how do musicians compose? They probably know a few chords, they throw a few chords together. Some modern musicians probably turn the chords upside down, inside out, and make them sound differently. Other musicians don't use chords at all. How do you write a book? How do you write poetry? 
Creativity is something that most children have naturally and it's kicked out of them after the age of six. The moment they start becoming self-conscious and they start entering the adult world, which is academic, which is prescribed, it makes you wonder where the real freedoms are. To me, the real freedom I enjoy is in my creativity, uh, which I'm happy to share. So I'm probably waffling on a little bit. And look, it's coming up for um, an hour. And I'm thinking, even though I designed it for half an hour, I think an hour is my maximum. So I'm going to say thank you very much for... Uh, for tuning in and please feel free to add more comments if you want to. I hope you found that of use.